The Constitution, drafted in secret in 1787, was designed to replace the Articles of Confederation when it became obvious that the Articles were too weak to hold the new nation together. The Founding Fathers were, so to speak, looking both ways. Forwards to a government run under explicitly codified rules, but backwards to the accumulated political wisdom of the ages. The Constitution was strongly marked by the cumulative insights of the Western political tradition. It should be seen as a very conservative kind of revolutionary document. The Federalist, an anthology of essays by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison and John Jay, written to persuade voters to adopt the Constitution, has become a durable conservative classic in American political philosophy. No sooner had the Constitution gone into operation, headed by the majestic President George Washington, the most famous and respected of all Americans, than the French Revolution began. An early division in the Republic developed between the Federalists, notably Washington, Hamilton and John Adams, who detested the French Revolution and everything it stood for, and the Republicans, notably Thomas Jefferson, who saw events in France as essentially liberating despite their excesses. Federalists favoured a foreign policy sympathetic to Britain, were sceptics about the idea of human equality, and hoped to restrain the development of popular democracy. Largely successful in the 1790s, they then lost the election of 1800 and watched in dismay as Jefferson and his party undertook dramatic steps in the direction of democracy and equality. Well, the Federalist, the Federalist Papers, persuaded enough voters throughout the nation to endorse the Constitution as the basis of America's government. After the Constitution had been drafted, it was put to the uh, electorate, and what was necessary was to get nine state uh, conventions to ratify the Constitution. Uh, Hamilton, Madison and John Jay, the three authors of the Federalist Papers, drafted these essays at very high speed, sometimes two or three per week, to be published in newspapers uh, in the summer of 1787. And they were all published collectively under one name, the name of Publius. This was a reference to Publius Valerius, who banished the last king of Rome and founded the Roman Republic. So again, looking back to a classical model of Republican virtue. And very often, the, uh, the articles written by Publius, uh, which were later gathered as the Federalist, were opposed, sometimes on the same page of the same newspapers, in another column, uh, by the anti-federalists, the people who wanted to keep the Articles of Confederation. So they were actually designed as parts of a propaganda campaign, and interested readers could look at the arguments for and against the Constitution as they were deciding which way they'd throw their own uh, votes and sympathies in the question of whether to adopt the new Constitution. Now, among other things, the, uh, the, the authors of The Federalist argued that the extent of the Republic was a strength and not a weakness. The traditional view was that Republics could only survive if they were small and if the citizens all knew one another and could actually meet face to face. But the authors of The Federalist said, no, because if we have a, a Republic of much greater extent, such as this already massive United States, Different interests in the uh, Republic will counterbalance one another, and that will have the benign effect of preventing the development of permanent factions. They also said, each department of the government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, will stand up for itself against the pretensions of the others so that human nature will limit rather than worsen the dangers. This is the idea of checks and balances, that each department, because it's run by people who are proud of their own particular role, are going to prevent the incursions of the other departments and prevent any one of them from becoming too powerful. And in one famous passage from Federalist 51, they express it like this. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government, but what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, 
and in the next place oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. In other words, ultimate authority does come from the people, but there are lots of safeguards along the way, filters against vice and against demagoguery and against ambition. And that little passage from Federalist 51 is very typical of the tone of voice of the Federalist. It's got its eyes wide open and it's not going to be lulled into a false sense of security. It's always going to look at the political situation as it really is, rather than as we might like it to be in a, an ideal world. Now, like their British predecessors, the F American Federalists, that is the politicians in the early Republic, disliked political parties because of the feeling that a party represented only one interest or one faction of the people rather than all of them. So even at a time that they were actually becoming involved in political, what we think of as political parties, they thought of them more as tendencies, they were resisting the idea that this was in fact what they were doing. Another argument put forward in the Federalist Papers was this, that it's actually good to have a big republic rather than a small one, because the larger the pool of citizens, the larger the likelihood that from among them you'll be able to find really virtuous representatives. They were much more interested in this question of the virtue of the politicians than in the question of direct representation. And as I've said, the system was designed to block the direct will of the people, not to gratify it, on the assumption that the passions of the ordinary people are transitory and fleeting, and that they don't know enough to act intelligently. The authors of The Federalist, Madison and Hamilton particularly, also asserted that the federal government would not get too powerful. The reason some people had opposed the Constitution, the anti-federalists, they were afraid that the central government would become too powerful. And so one thing that the authors of The Federalist were eager to do was to allay that fear by saying, no, the central government will not become too powerful. In Federalist 45, they put it like this. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties and properties of the people, and the internal order, improvement and prosperity of the state. In other words, in the events of your everyday life, you're not going to be troubled by the federal government. Your state is going to take care of that. Only in things touching on the national interest will the federal government be powerful and effective because the authors of The Federalist were aware that this was a, a real issue. Now, as I mentioned, the Federalist politicians of the 90s, the 1790s, didn't like the idea of political parties, even though in practice they were busily forming one. And it was the Federalist interest or the Federalist tendency which dominated the politics of the decade. They weren't parties of the, of the type we have now, highly organised with whips, but nevertheless they were recognisable interests and they were recognised as such at the time but they were very eager to uh, allay the allegation that they were selfish factions. Because they were so aware of the fact that this, in, in their own view, this had been the root of the trouble in England, that a faction around the king had misled him and caused him to usurp powers he ought not to have had. The Federalists were particularly eager also to deny the idea that the revolution had been revolutionary. Listen to Harrison Gray Otis. Uh, one of the Federalists, talking about his parents' generation, the revolutionaries. He said, Those people mistake altogether the nature of the political controversy between the American colonies and the British ministry, who suggest that our fathers were actuated by a radical spirit. They acted on the defensive and contended only for constitutional rights and privileges. Well, what made the Constitution work was the fact that George Washington was involved first in the writing of it and then in the running of it. Washington's willingness to accept the presidency at once gave it high prestige, which it otherwise certainly would not have enjoyed. As I mentioned in the last lecture, he was the most famous and the most respected person in America, the successful commander of the Continental Army. John Adams wanted him to be referred to as Your Excellency or Your Majesty rather than the much humbler title, Mr. President, which Washington preferred. Because Adams wanted to create an aura of reverence around the president, comparable to that which surrounded kings. And in fact, Adams wanted the presidential power to be much stronger. 
in the first days of the Constitution, before it had any of the weight of tradition to support it, the Federalists were looking for symbolic ways to support its authority. They had July the 4th parades, commemorations of the Declaration of Independence, uh, and parades on Washington's birthday, both of which were uh, disciplined and orderly, designed to emphasize that they weren't the same kind of rabble as was then participating in the French Revolution. John Adams himself was a great admirer of Edmund Burke, and both of them are very important figures in their respective nations in the 1790s, close contemporaries. Uh, and like Burke, Adams understood the dark passions and the need to be constrained by hierarchy and reverence and tradition. Now, again, I mentioned last time that, that Washington's willingness to relinquish power after two terms on the model of Cincinnatus was symbolically very important for the future of American political stability. Washington could almost certainly have become a king if he'd wanted. He could have probably have become King George I of America, although now that's a very odd thing to think of. But he believed in the rhetoric of republics and he believed in the models of Cato and Cincinnatus and was absolutely determined not to become a king. Relinquishing power established the precedent that power will in fact rotate and that every few years there will in fact be a different precedent. Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury, set about building a strong federal government that could inspire confidence in America's economic leaders. Hamilton decided that the federal government ought to accept the burden of all the federal government's accumulated debts and all the accumulated debts of the state governments. And, he said, we'll be able to um, inspire confidence in the uh, financial, se the commercial sector of society by resolving to pay these debts in full. So he willingly took on this burden of debt with the promise to repay because that would at once win to him, to, to the federal government, the loyalty of the creditors. Now, there'd been a great deal of speculation in depreciated money in the chaotic years of the Articles of Confederation. And that meant that some of the speculators were now going to get rich on the sacrifices which had actually been made by others, particularly soldiers in the Continental Army. But in Hamilton's view, again, an open-eyed view, this gave a direct material incentive as well as an idealistic and patriotic motive to support the regime. That was Hamilton's view. We've got to be practical. We've got to win the um, assent and loyalty and, and uh, enthusiasm of the wealthiest classes. Hamilton's report on manufactures is another important moment in the early history of the Republic because it's, he sought to set America on the road to industrialization and tariff protectionism. Protectionism, the, uh, imposing tariffs on imported, uh, imported goods from, from ab abroad, particularly from Britain, was necessary because Britain was already a much more industrialised country than the United States, whose imports, whose cheap manufacturers, would come into the American market cheaply and, and compete too successfully against their American start-up rivals. So Hamilton's idea was, by imposing tariffs, we'll create a protected env environment in which American industrialization can begin. And Hamilton even countenanced industrial espionage, um, trying to lure British technologists to America and learning their secrets, so that America could, America could compete more effectively. Hamilton, watching the very first stages of industrialization, recognized how important it was in enriching the nation and was uh, eager to, to take America down that road. The first great test for the New Republic was the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, and the new federal government certainly met the challenge. The Whiskey Rebellion was a protest against the new excise tax imposed by Hamilton, and it was a potential replay of Shays' Rebellion, which had led to a chaotic uh, breakdown of the Articles of Confederation. Now, Hamilton was determined to show that this time, an effective central authority could prevent anarchy. He persuaded President Washington in person to lead a large military force against the rebels. This was in western Pennsylvania. He called out the Virginia and Pennsylvania militias and put them under federal authority. And, under the leadership of old General Washington, 13,000 men, a, a disproportionately large army, crossed the Appalachians to uh, put down this western Pennsylvania rebellion. The rebel leaders fled in terror, having never anticipated that they were going to have to encounter a field army. The ringleaders were soon rounded up and convicted, but then 
pardoned when uh, passions had cooled to show that the new government could mix clemency with resolve. Well, Alexander Hamilton remains right up to the present one of the controversial figures in the American conservative pantheon. Strong government conservatives usually admire him. People like Abraham Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt later on admired Hamilton because of his decisiveness and because of his willingness to use strong federal powers. Whereas states' rights conservatives have usually deprecated and deplored the memory of Alexander Hamilton because they think that he, he took too much power into the hands of the central authority. The outbreak of the French Revolution and its rapid descent into chaos and terror dismayed the Federalists and prompted them to seek a pro-British foreign policy. First the terror of 1793, then the rise of Napoleon fulfilled their idea, based on the Whig tradition, that revolution leads first to anarchy and then to the rise of a tyrant. It, the, the rise of Napoleon seemed almost like a textbook illustration of what would happen. And, and Napoleon's unbroken military successes in the 1790s led to the destruction of the frail European republics, Holland and Switzerland and Venice. One by one they were taken over by Napoleon's forces. The Federalists remembered that French military aid had been decisive in helping the United States win its independence from Britain. Wasn't it now possible, they said, that France might use comparable power to overwhelm America? That's why, despite the, the fact that the American Revolutionary War was still a recent memory, the Federalists shifted to a pro-British foreign policy. They, they were attracted by Britain's political stability in, in contradistinction to the turmoil in France. Now the Federalists, uh, sceptical as they were about democracy, feared the spread of revolutionary contagion to America just as Burke and Pitt feared its spread to England. John Adams was elected as the second president in the election of 1796 and he dreaded uh, democracy. He hated election day because it always seemed to him to put the nation on the brink of chaos. As I mentioned before, elections both in England and in America had no secret ballot. That means that election day was a day of open bribery and enormous amount of drunkenness because very often candidates would try to get the voters drunk so that they'd vote their way. Sometimes pitched battles in the streets, open intimidation of voters by people who had power over them. Every election day was chaotic like that. It wasn't until the late 19th century that the secret ballot would be imported, an Australian invention. And the Federalist politicians did not believe that it was their job to give uh, direct representation to the material interests of their electors. Listen to a Federalist named w William Richardson Davy from North Carolina, uh, and particularly the haughty tone of voice in which he delivers it. He says, I never have, and I never will, surrender my principles to the opinions of any man or description of men, either in or out of power. And I wish no man to vote for me who is not willing to leave me free to pursue the good of my country according to the best of my judgment without respect either to party men or party views. In other words, I know best and I'm not going to let you, the voters, tell me uh, what to say in, in Congress when I go there as your representative. Uh, it's comparable to the, to the tone of voice of Coriolanus in Shakespeare's famous play, the, the successful general who despises the common people and hates having to go electioneering among them, and who in the end, whose pride finally brings him down. The Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans both had active propaganda machines because America had an unusually high degree of literacy, so it was possible for lots of people to read political controversy. And the 1790s was a very politicised decade. One of the Federalist propagandists was William Cobbett, an English radical who'd expected to love American liberty, but actually found it vulgar and abrasive. He was the publisher of Porcupine's Gazette in Philadelphia. And uh, Cobbett writes scornfully about uh, his discovery of, of what's happening in America as it becomes more democratic. He says, I have seen piety give place to contempt of religion, plain dealing exchange for shuffling and fraud. Universal confidence for universal suspicion and distrust. A country, once the seat of peace and good neighbourhood, torn to pieces by faction, plunged by intriguing demagogues into never-ceasing hatred and strife. A people once too fond of what they called liberty to bear the sway of a British king, humbly bend their necks to the yoke, nay, to the very foot of a set of grovelling despots. <laughs>
So <laughs> jarring propaganda there from Cobbett uh, and his horrified turning away from the new rep uh, democratic way of life. Well, now, John, President Adams' vice president was the, mem was the leader of the opposite faction, Thomas Jefferson, because the, uh, the rules for the vice presidency were different in those days. Jefferson had been in France as America's ambassador in 1789, and he'd found the revolution, at least to begin with, inspiring. And for that reason, Jefferson was a, a much feared person. The Federalists detested Jefferson and everything he stood for in the 1790s. By now, Jefferson's so much one of the venerated founders of the Republic, that it's difficult for us to get back into the frame of mind of the Federalists, who thought of him as a horrifying figure, a Jacobin. They alleged that he had the same beliefs as the most radical of the French revolutionaries. Well, like the British government, the American government in the 1790s uh, supported repressive legislation to try to limit free speech and to hinder the immigration into America of European radicals. In particular, they passed the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, according to which alien radicals could be deported without trial. All the people tried under the Acts were Jeffersonian Republicans. Some Federalists also wanted the United States to declare war against France, particularly after the French government pointedly insulted the American negotiators in what's remembered as the XYZ affair. The, the French politicians demanded bribes in return for giving access to the national leaders. It certainly was not an affront to America's dignity as a new nation. But President Adams was sober and cautious enough to resist that idea, particularly because in the 1790s the United States still didn't have an effective military force, certainly not one that could match up to Napoleon. Jefferson and Madison wrote the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions in 1798 and 99 as a protest against the Alien and Sedition Acts. They reasserted the old anti-federalist claims from ten years before. And they anticipated the nullification crisis and the eventual con Confederate secession. What they said was, the Alien and Sedition Acts have been passed by the federal government, but in doing so it exceeds its actual powers. It isn't entitled to legislate in that way, to restrict freedom of speech inside the states. And in cases like that, when the federal government exceeds its proper um, limits of authority, the states are entitled to nullify that legislation within their own boundaries. This was um, a theme that was going to be played out recurrently in the crises which led up to the American Civil War. Well, now the Federalists lamented their defeat in the election of 1800 by Jefferson. But in the long view, it's possible to see that defeat as a vital contribution to the durability of the Constitution and of the American conservative tradition. Federalists regarded the election of Jefferson and his Jacobin Republicans as a catastrophe. It was almost as though they'd been taken in by their own propaganda and that they really thought of Jefferson as a dangerous radical who would bring chaos and danger to decent Americans. For example, Timothy Dwight, the president of Yale University, said this. Uh, he was himself a, an ardent Federalist. Can serious and reflecting men look about them and doubt that if Jefferson is elected and the Jacobins get into authority, those morals which protect our lives from the knife of the assassin, which guard the chastity of our wives and daughters from seduction and violence, defend our property from plunder and devastation, and shield our religion from contempt and profanation, will not be trampled upon? Well, now, in fact, of course, Jefferson was anything but a dangerous radical, despite his religious scepticism and despite his faith in the common farmer. Jefferson certainly was not a Jacobin. Now, in the long run, even conservatives should uh, rejoice at the election of 1800. In fact, some historians call it the Revolution of 1800 because it established the principle that uh, peaceful transitions of power can take place between different parties, that the winners did not take reprisals against the losers, the losers admitted that they had lost, and therefore peaceful, changes of, peaceful changeovers of power between the parties could take place. And of course that's a tradition which has persisted ever since. We're so familiar with that fact, the fact that regularly there are changeovers of power, it's easy for us to forget how unusual it is in world history.
And it's something that many democracies have never managed to accomplish. If you think of the frail post-colonial democracies of Africa, for example, repeatedly there are perhaps one or two elections, but then a military strongman seizes power and abolishes the democratic constitution altogether. Only in the most politically stable places, such as the English-speaking countries, is it possible for both parties to agree to the principle of the election and then to honour its outcome. That means, of course, that the losers don't need to fear the winners. And nobody needs to fear the implications of voting the other way. After, 18, after 1800, the Federalists increasingly became a regional party, confined really to New England. And reluctantly and slowly, they, they began to adopt democratic electioneering techniques. Younger Federalists recognised in particular that this was essential if they were ever to regain any power. Here's William Plumer, a young Federalist, writing to an older one and urging him to adapt to new realities. He writes... Abjure that uprightness which cannot accommodate itself to events, which cannot flatter the people, that stiff, ungracious patriotism which professes to save the people from their worst enemies themselves. In other words, Plume is pointing out, they're not going to elect us if we spend much of our time when we're electioneering um, insulting them. We've got to be more circumspect, we've got to be more tactful. Now, in the following years, in the, year, in the years of the first decade of the 19th century, the most ambitious Federalists began to change sides. In particular, John Quincy Adams, the former president's son, became a Republican in 1809, and he went on then to a distinguished career, first in diplomacy and then eventually in the presidency. He was president, uh, it won the election of 1824. The Federalists, what was left of them, further discredited themselves in the War of 1812, which they thought of as a catastrophic mistake, by calling the Hartford Convention to discuss the possibility of Northern secession. Once again, it's something that's difficult to remember. We're so familiar with the fact that in the end, it was a group of Southern states that seceded in 1860 and 61, that we forget that the first secession movement came in New England when the pro-British Federalists of New England were so horrified by the anti-British War of 1812 that they thought of leaving the Republic altogether. One of the great points of difference between the, uh, the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans was the question of religion. One of the things that Jefferson was proudest of in his entire career was the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty and the, ins and the insistence which he made of the absolute separation of church and state. But by contrast, most of the New England Federalists favoured having a state church. They followed the Erastian tradition from Europe, which specifies that the state and the church uphold each other. Now, the First Amendment to the Constitution, as it was written, merely said that Congress could not establish a church or abridge free exercise of religion. Each of the states was free to continue to do so if it wanted to. Connecticut had an established church until 1818. And Massachusetts had an established church all the way through until 1832. It wasn't until much later that the amendments were um, applied to the states more immediately. Just before he left office, President Adams, uh, in the, uh, at the end of his administration, just after the election of Jefferson, appointed John Marshall as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And this was a position which Marshall then held until his death in 1835. And Marshall's one of the most important people, perhaps the most important person, in the entire history of the Supreme Court. In a series of influential decisions, Marshall established the principle of judicial review and judicial supremacy, which have characterised the role of the Supreme Court ever since. Now, Marshall was what's called a broad constructionist. That is, he used ambiguous areas of the Constitution to advance the authority of the federal government. He worked very, very hard to get unanimity in decisions, that is, to get all the judges to agree, so that the Supreme Court's voice would speak uh, in unison with, with correspondingly greater power and prestige. In the case Marbury versus Madison from 1803, he established the, the principle of judicial review. In other words, that when Congress passed a law, the Supreme Court would have the right to review it to decide whether or not it was constitutional. And in certain circumstances, the, the Supreme Court could reject the law on grounds that it didn't meet constitutional tests. Now, the practical effect of, uh, of establishing judicial review was to make the Supreme Court more important than it had previously been, and, of course, to enhance the role of an unelected part of the Constitution.
the court, the court's prestige was increased, and of course its membership was not, vol was not susceptible to direct election. So that uh, conservatives who'd been afraid of too much democracy in the Constitution should, would, have, would have taken heart at the idea that now these highly trained legal experts were playing a permanent role without being um, vulnerable to election and to being thrown out by the voters. This is another of those things that we're almost too familiar with to realise how significant it is and the benign conservative effects which flow from it. Even Republican appointees to the Supreme Court, like Justice, Justice Joseph Story, came to share Marshall's view of the court. So Marshall, when he died in 1835, left the court incomparably stronger and more central to national life than it had been in the 1790s.